Hey everyone, this is the first of what I hope to be several video vignettes where I get to share some things that I feel like God's been saying to me and some things I really want to share with you. Now, I'm coming to you from my backyard today, so if you hear weird noises, I'll, I'll try to explain it to you as we go. Hey, today I want to talk about, of all things, uh, life expectancy. Now your thoughts immediately go to longevity, you know, how long am I going to live? Well, okay, I want to include something else besides longevity, that's part of it, but also quality. Let's, let's uh, look at our expectations of life, they, both in what kind of life we're looking for and how long is it going to last. <clears throat> I have expectations, you have expectations, and in fact we have expectations of everybody and everything in this life. I was thinking the other day when I go out to eat, boy do I have high expectations. I have high expectations of the chef, the kitchen staff, the servers, the management, and I, I want them to be so excited that I am their customer when I walk in there. I, I expect to be treated really, really well. Not quite like royalty. Okay, maybe like royalty. I, I just expect a wonderful experience there. And Now to be fair, I would imagine that the folks at the restaurant have some expectations in me, particularly the servers. I mean, I think they'd like me to receive their service with congeniality, a smile. And of course, at the end of the day, what? A generous gratuity, of course. We all have expectations. There's not an area of our life that we, we'd be hard pressed to find any area where we don't have high expectations. Think about your job, your employees, your employer, your family, your children, your spouse. We have high expectations of all these people in our lives. And then if you broaden the category, I mean, don't we have an expectation that life would be fair? Don't we have an expectation that we'd be in good health? I mean, why not? Of course. And that we would even prosper. Well, sure, of course, we all have that. In fact, if you wanted to boil all that down and make it more concise, I would say that the foundational expectation is that the purpose of life is to meet my needs fulfill all of my expectations. Why wouldn't I think that? I was born and raised in a culture that promoted an individualistic mindset that said life is all about me. Didn't you? Of course you did. And, and how could you possibly escape that? That's, that's the water we were swimming in for so long. In fact, my expectations for life in that culture are so grandiose, you know, it would take more than one lifetime. Now we're talking longevity. It'd take two or three lifetimes to get all my expectations fulfilled, all my needs met. So that leads to, okay, well, how long is it going to last? I need to prolong it. It needs to be as long as it can possibly be. Now listen, I, I, I want to just say that it's normal to cling to life. It's normal to fight for life. It's normal to resist death because we're part of God's creation. Death was never supposed to be a part of it. We are actually wired for eternity. One wise king said that God has placed eternity in our hearts. But when it comes to life expectations and life expectancy, how many of us actually factor in that word eternity? That is really interesting to me. And not many people want to even face that question. You see, nobody thinks about the here and now life ending. What we think about, what we've been programmed for is get all we can, can all we get, and sit on the can. Um, it's all about the here and now, but nobody thinks about the here and now ending until or unless they're actually faced with it face to face, probably through the death of a loved one, or perhaps with facing their own mortality when they get a potentially terminal diagnosis. Uh, then we're kind of faced with it. You know, in my tenure as a pastor, I've probably done 65, 75 funerals. I would tell you the hardest funerals to do are those unexpected ones, infants, teenagers, suicide victims, young mom, young dad who, who pass and leave children behind. Those are so hard. Those are tragedies. I want you to know those are tragedies in every sense of the word. They're tragedies for us. They're tragedies in the eyes of God. It's not what God intended for human life. Those funerals are very difficult. All funerals are difficult. Those are particularly difficult. And at the funeral, we try our best to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we want to draw comfort and peace and solace from, from the very real presence of God. And we do that, and we do it as best we can uh, for the folks who are there. We try to engage them in that. And inevitably, we get to a place in, in, the, in the funeral service where the word eternity comes up. Now, I can't express to you how difficult it is sometimes. I, I can feel that word 
rolling off my tongue, passing my lips and falling straight to the floor. And, and no sense of what that really means ever hits the mind and the hearts of the mourners. I think it's because we lack an imagination for, for eternity. And how does, that, how does that fit with the present? You know, it, it's, I feel like sometimes at those funerals, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving a placebo. You know, it's gonna be totally without effect. But it was a placebo that was prescribed by our faith traditions. All our faith traditions prescribe something for us to swallow during those moments that are so difficult to process. And even if we get it down, it has no effect. It's a placebo. We lack an imagination for what that means and what, you know, perhaps here's the thing. Perhaps we are viewing eternity as an extension of life beyond the here and now, beyond, and with no real connection to this here and now at all. That could be a problem. So some people just simply have no concept for eternity and all of their eggs are in this basket. There's no connection there. We're hoping if there's something on the other side, uh, we'll, we'll find out what it is and we'll experience the good. Here's another thing that can happen to folks. It happened to me as a middle teenager. And I think it's another reason for a lack of imagination. And, and it's, it's a cultural issue, but it's a religious culture issue. You see, many of us came up with a system of belief that was taught to us by, by the church. And, and the system of belief is very simply put, it's this, reward and punishment. If you're good in this life, then God's gonna reward you with eternal life where in this thing called heaven, whatever, wherever that is. If you're evil in this life or you don't measure up or whatever, then God will punish you for all eternity in, in hell, what, whatever you might think that is. Now, there are a lot of opinions about heaven and hell, um, but I think for a lot of Christians, it is a reality that impacts their whole idea about their expectations for life and life expectancy. In my opinion, for what it's worth. I think since the Reformation, too much emphasis has been placed on Dante Allegori's Inferno and his writings about hell, and too much emphasis on what the reformers had to say about hell instead of relying on what the Bible actually says and what Orthodox teaching taught for so many hundreds of years before the Reformation. But that's the story for another day. But it does, this idea of reward, punishment, heaven, hell sort of thing, affects our expectations in life and life expectancy. So here's how it worked for me. As a middle teenager, I went to a church that was determined to save me. Save me from what? From hell. And the reason, the, the way you save me from hell is by scaring the hell out of me and by making threats of, of what? My eternity. And so I spend my life trying to protect and preserve my eternity, which I'm not even sure I believe in, but I've been told that it could be really bad. So I got to live my life in a certain way in order to make that happen. And every single week I would be reminded, having lived a life that was less than stellar during the week, I'd be reminded on the weekends that, hey, if you don't get this together, then you could be punished for all of eternity. And what happens is many people go down that road and end up never living the life God gave them in the here and now. They're always trying to protect and preserve the one that's coming. So here we go. We, we have a cultural assimilation where we're trying to protect and preserve all that we can accumulate and, and hold on to that for this life in the here and now. And then, and then you could be a religious person who says, no, I got to protect and preserve what's coming later, even though I don't understand that. And I, But either way, I miss out living life the way it was supposed to be right here, right now, however long it happens to be. I think Jesus said something about that. He said, if you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll actually find it. Now, here's an interesting observation. In the last 50 years in the global church, there's been less emphasis on hell. Um, not because that belief system of reward punishment went away, but because it's just not very comforting and it's not very, uh, people don't like to hear it so much. So the emphasis has shifted, particularly in charismatic faith churches, uh, but it's, it's really drifted over in, into mainline churches as well. 
And what's happened is you can actually, you should be focusing on your best life now. That's, that's a phrase that somebody coined. You can have your best life now. And how do you do that? Well, by focusing on your expectations. Oh, well, what are my expectations? Whatever God has promised in the Bible. And so we have scoured the pages of the scripture to find promises that may or may not apply to the here and now, but we make them for the here and now because what? This what fits what our expectation is. It's for this life now. So you can see whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you can end up in the same place. No imagination for life. No imagination for life expectancy that brings hope and joy and peace that, that transcends the here and now and includes the here and later of the kingdom of God. You know, a few months ago, my son Brian was diagnosed with ALS. Uh, you, you know all that, I won't tell you too much of the detail here. All I can tell you is that it was absurd, it was insane, it was surreal. It was like, it was like, um, it was like getting punched in the gut. And right when you, you crouch over to protect your gut, you catch a left hook right in the jaw. And it just leaves you staggering. So there you are, staggering, confused, and gasping for air at the same time. You know, the emotional pain of that, the, uh, the unbelief of the diagnosis overwhelms faith at times. Denial rises up. Grief sets in. Anger takes over. Sometimes anger even directed at, at God. And it's impossible to contain it. I, I don't actually think you should contain it. I think you should be honest about it. Talk to your good shepherd about it. I will say this, though. The thing that I will never forget is, I don't know if it was maybe a couple of weeks after the diagnosis, Brian said to me, he said, Dad, why not me? Usually we say, why me? And Brian said, why not me? I could think of a million reasons. I'm sure he already had two, and he probably discussed them with his good shepherd, but, but on this day, he was going, like, I'm not immune to this stuff. Why not me? You know, within three weeks of his diagnosis, I was diagnosed with stage four mantle cell lymphoma and with some weird complications, you know, and I went through that whole thing all over again, you know, punch to the gut, left hook to the jaw. What are my expectations? What are your expectations? You know, something like that happens and suddenly your whole world is flipped on its head. And you got to do something with those expectations. You really do. So you try to get to God with it. And you know, the Apostle Paul said, we have the mind of Christ. You know, you think about that. That's amazing. It means we can think his thoughts. We can, we can know what he's thinking. We have the mind of Christ. But we also have a mind that has been shaped by our culture, our experience in that culture. And it's been shaped by faulty theology. The two things I talked about earlier. The Apostle Paul said, don't be conformed to this world. Do you know what he meant? He meant don't be conformed to the cultural ideas about life, but also don't be conformed to the religious ideas. He said, be conformed to the image of Christ. He said, be conformed by the renewing of your mind. I like to call it the renovation of the imagination. And you see, that's where the problem is. We we don't connect the two. We can't connect this eternity with this here and now. Here and later with here and now just doesn't make sense for us. You know, for the last 15 years, I've been working on the renovation of my imagination. I've immersed myself, and Brian has too, and several of our friends, our pastor friends, we've immersed ourselves in the biblical narrative. And it has brought such clarity, well, a lot more clarity than we ever had before, about life as it is and as it will be. It's taken a tremendous amount of reflection, study, reading, meditating, conversation with friends, just batting things around. And, and you, you, you wonder when ideas get challenged and your imagination is being 
renovated and, and you're beginning to think differently about things, hopefully more like Christ thinks about and views things, uh, you wonder if it's really working and then suddenly it's manifested in your life when you're faced with something and you say, why not me? You realize what a total shift that is. What a shift that is. I think it's been happening all along, this shift. But for both of us, this this particular experience is where the proverbial rubber hits the road. So how has it affected our expectation of life and life expectancy? Well, I can't get really deeply into it on this one. We'll talk some more about it later, but I think I can make a couple of salient points. Number one, I must say, we're not afraid to die. Even if we die, we live. This is one part of the story in which we live with our families, our friends, God, creation, our neighbors, our church community. This is one small part, a very important part, but it's just a part. When it becomes everything, we're going to have some weird expectations. Now don't get me wrong, both Brian and I do have difficult days. We have moments of despair, but overall those moments don't dominate the landscape of our minds. Because we draw strength, we draw courage, we draw encouragement from God, but also from family, friends, and fellow travelers on the journey. We receive love from people, and we are rescued out of our, our despair from time to time by people, by God. And we're set back firmly on a path. And so there's nothing wrong with having those days. For goodness sakes, we're human. But we're not afraid to die. Interesting thing has happened. We both seem to be, as we discuss it, thinking more of our loved ones than we do of ourselves. I've said it a bunch of times, Brian has too, that I'm really sorry that my family has to go through this. And of course, you know, they're going like, man, I'm so sorry you have to go through this. No, I'm sorry you have to go through this. It's, both of us have felt like we are well positioned to go through it. I don't know why, but why not? Let's, we, let's do it. And uh, God is with us. We'll, one way or another, we're gonna make it. I think maybe that's a renovation of the imagination, don't you? I mean, if this would have happened to me 20 years ago, I'll tell you what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about me with all my expectations. It's a little different. I think it is happening. Of course, nobody wants to die. Brian does and I don't, at least not until it's time. So we're both gonna fight. We fight death, we fight disease because it's what we're wired for. Um, but not just to increase physical life expectancy as we once knew it. It's not just about extending physical life for the sake of physical life. It's for, yeah, I don't know if I like this word or not, but I'll say it's for legacy. We both still have a lot to give. We wanna fight so that we can live to lead our families, our friends, our loved ones, our churches, into this glorious life of the kingdom, living the way of Jesus. But it's even more than legacy. Legacy speaks only of what is left behind. Legacy is not a bad thing. It's just not the only thing. You see, legacy is connected. What I leave behind is connected to the future. It's, it's the future is already present and I'm living the future, then I am living a legacy already if you can see it. Living the life of the future in the present is probably the best legacy any human being could leave behind. Living the way of Christ, living the kingdom life. Someone told me once, 
many years ago, hey, if I live the way of Christ and I die and the whole Christian thing turns out to be bogus, I will still have lived a very good life. Boy, is that the truth. Not that I think it's bogus, it's not, but it's the best way to live. Well, how do I live again? I have to factor in the future because the future is already present. I live the life of Christ of the future in the present and it changes all those expectations. I'm convinced that life expectancy when it comes to longevity is forever. Here and now and here and then. It'll be right here when it's all over. Everything will be restored to original intent. Evil and death will be no more. Everything, everyone that we love here and now will be there here and then. Everything that is good and right and beautiful will remain. All that we love and share the here and now with will share the here and then with us and our Creator. Life expectancy. Now, in a very practical way, I've been trying to live this out for several years, but it's affected my expectations for life, and here, here they are. I want to live this life with nothing to gain. And I want to spend it all trying to accumulate and achieve and hoard. <laughs> I want to live it as if I have nothing to gain. And well, how could I do that? Because I've already gained Christ. I have eternity. I have life that'll last forever. I want to live my life with nothing to gain. I want to live it with nothing to lose. I don't want to waste my time arguing with people. Why? Because I don't have to win. I don't have anything to lose. The Apostle Paul said, everything that was gained to me, I've already lost it, so what else is there? <laughs> it's actually quite liberating to get to that place. And then thirdly, want to live not only with nothing to gain, nothing to lose, but also nothing to prove. Except the love of God for all people. That expectation of life fits the here and now, but it also fits eternity. The only thing that makes this life sensible is that it is connected to eternity. The here and now and the here and later. The here and later has invaded the present world. And we have the opportunity to live that here and later in the here and now. Yeah. That's a good expectation. That's a good life. Hey, thanks for listening. It's probably a little bit longer than what I was expecting today, but God bless you. We'll see you next time.